Hello! How are you? I am excited to be here. I'm with Elaine Williams. And I'm with Kathy Keegan. And this is still human. Oh, yes. After all these years. Yes. And today, we are talking about... Awareness. Self-awareness. Self-awareness and listening? What? (laughs) Thank you. Yes. Well-rehearsed bad joke. But no. Yes, we are. We are talking about awareness because we were talking about how, in many ways, it's a superpower. It's just not a sexy one. You know how we've talked about that? How there are certain tools that are so powerful, but we don't give them much stock. Oh, like breathing. Like breathing, breathing. right. Right. Breathing is not this fancy app, and it's like, it's so powerful. It's how you process emotions and how you get grounded and get back into your body. It's how you sing. It's how you speak for hours and hours and hours correctly. Mm -hmm. It's everything. It's everything. But it's not this sexy, cool app, and so people don't always want to... Right. Or it's easy to discount. It is easy to discount because you have it at your fingertips. And there are elements of who we are as people where if something seems a little out of reach, somehow it's a little bit more desirable, right? Or the whole scarcity effect. Right. And that's a whole show right there in and of itself. That's a monologue. But we could not even talk about this right now at all if we did not have awareness. Right. If we did not have a sense of, you know, starting to pay attention to what is going on now and sort of being here now. And it's not easy to be here now. It's not. And, you know, we we wanted to make this podcast for people, for anybody who's ever been stuck. Yeah. Whether stuck in business, feeling like you're stuck in your life, feeling like you're on an, on a hammer, ham, hammer, a hamster treadmill. <laughs> oh, one of those hammer hamster wheels. <laughs> oh, yeah. I always felt like I was like running so fast and then I wasn't getting anywhere. Well, and it's higher stakes with the hammers, right? Because you risk getting <laughs> killed. I didn't um, know that there was a hammer hamster, but you you get the point. Right? I get the point. Yeah. And and I remember, you know, we were talking about how today's transformation could be tomorrow's ego trip. Yeah. And I know for me, I so many times I'd be like, oh, I've already done work on that. Yeah. Or I've done so much work, 20 years of transformational work. I've done Landmark and Debbie Ford and Peak Potentials. And I've done EFT and Alexander, you know, the, the list goes on and on, which is great. But if you're still feeling stuck or struggling, maybe there's something else to be aware of, um, right? Elaine, are you saying that you might have a part in it. <gasps> dun, 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 dun. No. Oh, yes. That, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, it's so true. And yet, what is it about human nature? I feel like it's just human nature to be like, it's their fault. Or it's not my fault. I'm da 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 Or, you know, like I was stuck in a tech nightmare with two different companies this week. I'll spare you the details. But they both were going like this to me. And I was like, I'm stuck in the middle at the X. Oh, that's that's me with my health care. Oh, God. Absolutely. Because this one blames that one. And and you're right. It's a it's not really a good model for living to start blaming other people for things. Right. The awareness. And like I always talk about this with my with my AA sponsor is I'll be like, oh, I feel like I'm coughing up a hairball. (laughs) Cause I'll be like, I really see I'm the source of my discontent or my resentment or whatever. That's right. right. I'm the source of it. And that's always like great news and bad news. Right. Like it makes me want to just. Right. I, you know, I think that was, um, a big key component because one of the things I'm a Libra, I'm an INFP for you, um, you know, test people out there and everything. Does it mean you have but, the scales oh my of God, justice? I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm my whole job. Why am I a coach? I mean, because I know how to be, I know how to be neutral. I make it my job to be as neutral as possible to, to work with clients and give them the space to be heard. Like take realizing that you have a part of right, it. Right. That, whatever that, it is, the right. good or the bad or whatever. Right. Exactly. And I didn't want to admit that because it wasn't fair. It's not fair. Oh. The Libra. It's not fair that this is happening. And you know what? That can be perfectly true. That can be perfectly true. I think what we're talking about are these different levels on which thing on which things happen, right? right. And so um, I can be, I, 
I can still have a part in something and it can still not be fair. But I always thought I'm off the hook because I feel aggrieved. I feel victimized. Well, and I, you know, I've learned, right, self-awareness, all this work. When I have that little girl voice in my head going, but it's not fair. <laughs> it's not fair. I know for me now, that's a red flag. Yeah. Because life is not fair. We could spend a lot of time talking about the insanity of world geopolitics and racial injustice and social injustice and the misogyny against women and blah, 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 blah. but like I still choose to live try to live my best life and so you know if you're like okay you're right life isn't fair and what next to do right exactly right and um that that was always so so hard for me to come to grips with that and i love your image of the hairball because it's like that's it's like i'm coming to a, i'm coming to this level of awareness that i have a part to play and i've got to look at my part it doesn't absolve other people of their responsibility it doesn't forgive it doesn't do anything but it feels you still have that feeling like with all the laundry list of work i've done I've been paying attention to myself. Why do I have to still keep working at it? Right. You know, and and, and you can choose not to. Right. But, but there's power. I mean, this whole thing is like, let's empower each other and our listeners. How can you, if you feel stuck, there might be an opportunity to look at yourself in a whole new way or with a different perspective, you know, and, and. And we were talking about how hindsight's not really 2020. Right. I, I do love that saying hindsight's 2020. But usually, no, it's a it's a filter, it's a perception, it's our memory. And they've done studies that our memories are really not accurate much. We're storytellers. At all. We are storytellers. In fact, tell us, tell me the story about your um <laughs> your yearbook, please. Oh, and my yearbook. Funny. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, um one of the things is I started to get more aware of my part in things in a way that allowed me to be able to start to like detach, let go, untangle. We were, we were talking about untangling. I had this whole story. I had this whole narrative about my yearbook. And it was just like, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. I had a whole story about it and everything. And my husband found my yearbook online and he looked it up and we looked at it. And he said, I think you need to see this. And my slogan was, when you say goodbye, always leave them laughing. <laughs> and so now, there was no lemonade. At all. There was no lemonade involved at all. Were and there yet, no lemons? Nothing. But okay. in my mind, that was what was in my yearbook. Now, again, I'm not always looking at my yearbook, but that became kind of a a watchword for me or a phrase that this is how I made my life better. It was like, here come, I didn't really believe when life gives you lemons, make lemonade, but I just kept saying it over and over again. And then I started making lemonade. It's like, that is so boring. That is like <laughs> the most boring story in the world. And the thing is, when you say goodbye, always leave them laughing is actually more appropriate because I also wasn't doing that. <laughs> But eventually I did do that, right? So that's the thing. So You like, worked on it with your I, improv. I worked on it with my yes, improv. Yes. I worked on it, and I worked on it in the workplace. That's you what know, I was going to ask right. you next. Yes. yes, Kathy Keegan, notorious burner of bridges. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Uh, do not use gas on steel. Doesn't work. Um, so only kidding, for, but I'm bummed. Because this is what you do. You help people decide if they're going to stay if they can do a reframe and stay in their corporate environment or yes. leave elegantly. And this all started because you used to be the queen of burning bridges. So tell yes. us about that. Well, the first thing is I'd like to quote The Clash and say, should I stay or should I go? <laughs> um, that was The Clash. And, and you know, that is a very, very important concept to, to make that decision, um, to even know you have the choice to do that. You might be able to make things better where you are, you know, but I didn't think you could because my whole, my mo the model I lived on was you've wronged me. I hate you. I must now leave. And there must be drama. And it's not a way so to live. How would you burn bridges? Give us an example. Well, I just get mad at somebody and then I'd hate them and then not want to talk to them anymore. So I just disappear off it's the face really of the earth. Not really conducive for thought, happy work environment. Right, because right. I thought I thought I needed some kind of special permission to do that, and I didn't think I had the permission. Oh. When in fact, 
I could just sort of say, you know what, this isn't working. No harm, no foul. And I didn't understand how you got there. Because, again, you grow up with the models you grew up with. And in my right. family, my brother Patrick, when he was 12, didn't hold a door open for an elderly lady. And my great aunt hated him for the rest of her life. Like, that was it. The mistake was made. No You're dead going to me. back. That's it. Okay. Right. So you used to get mad at somebody. And, and you would And then off. just be like, and storm off. And you would leave. And there would be drama. And there would be, the bridge would be no more. And I hated myself. And you hated yourself. And then you... I imagine you drag a little bit of that with you into the next environment. Yes. And then you wonder, why does this feel dysfunctional? Why does this feel like my family? Oh, and I'm still doing work because, of course, I'm in therapy and I'm, you know, doing all these things. And and again, you know, there there are levels and stages, I think, of adulthood, of life. Adulting, yeah. And all that because, you know, you do get the awarenesses kind of when it's time to get the awareness. It's like in anything you practice, my voice teacher could say to me the same thing for years and years and and years. And then you might say, hey, Kath, what about that? And then I run to my voice teacher. I'm like, guess what? This. And she said, I've only said that 12,000 times. My mother does that all the time. Right. Right. And you have to also, that's it. When I'm teaching people, I can't be vested in the fact that the learning, that their learning might come from me. Their learning could come from anywhere. Right. And I need to be open to allowing that to happen. Right. Not the egoic business of, why will I teach this and I teach that and you're going to learn this. It's not necessarily about that. It's, it's In fact, it's more likely that we'll talk about something. They go and meet a friend and the friend says one thing and they'll come back to you and they're like, oh, my God, I finally got it with X, Y, and Z. Right. You know, and it's like, good. That's, I love that's that. the whole idea. Right. All roads lead to the same thing. Right. I love that saying, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Yeah. Sometimes the teacher's been like, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm hanging out. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Right. Okay, so you used to burn bridges. Right. And then you were able to not burn bridges. And now you help people. Tell me about, you've told me about so many of your clients, but this woman was really suffering in her job. Oh, it, was, it was so hard. And I related so much because I was too in my own job. Um, Partly because of the stories you were making up, right? Stories that I was telling myself and and things that I thought that I could change. Things that I thought that I had control over and power over. And the big learning as we grow older, or as we mature, I guess, is that there are a lot more things we don't have control over. And actually, about the only thing I have control over is me. Is What? My... <laughs> I'm leaving? This is not in my contract? I did not know? No, just, yeah. It's it's humbling, isn't it's it? It's so <laughs> The older so you get, humbling. you're like, yeah, okay. Ah, it's like, Change oh, the world! Right. I still want to do that in my own... Right. little way and it's there's a lot of factors happening right and the best way that you can change the world is by being present by being here now and by paying attention to what's going on and so what i'm able to do when i'm working with clients is to help them you know they'll they'll make a comment about something so i'll you know, say a little bit more about what's going on there and then you can just ask is that true well, I, I mean, I think that that's what he would say. Oh, okay. So that's good. So you think, so what are some other things they might say? Right. And so then you're allowed, to, that's how you start to begin to untangle that. Right. And then you get to a more neutral place for yourself mm. where you're able to kind of say, oh, okay, wait a minute. So then again, you're getting to see your part. You're not necessarily letting people off the hook that you're not ready to let off the hook, but you're not stuck to them either. You're not because stuck. That's, you get, because that's the, that's the sticky part is because you want an outcome for that person. So when I was managing people, um, because uh, we're people, and <laughs> but when I was managing, um, you know, someone would come to me and they'd have a complaint about somebody else or some kind of a conflict. And so I'd have to say to them you know, we're going to talk about this and then I'm going to address that with the person. But you need to be prepared for what it is you actually expect. Because you've come to me, do you want to work this out? Do you want this to, what kind of conclusion are you looking for? Mm -hmm. Because if you're looking for me to fire that person because of X, Y, and Z, that's probably not going to be the outcome. Because the way we work here is that we call something to someone's attention. I have to hear what they have to say about it. Right. right. And so it's getting reasonable about what you think is going to happen, because I would have people come to me and be like, she smiled. And it's just sort of <laughs> like, yeah, you know what? You know how that is. It's like someone you don't really like. And you're like, why are they happy? 
doesn't matter. But that's a way of being stuck and attached to somebody else's outcome that has right. nothing to do with you. Or, or you know, you, you've given the example how you walk by somebody's desk and they're, that's the one time in the whole day they're surfing or whatever. Right. So you make up a, a story about them like, well, right. they're lazy. They're not, they're not pulling their weight. And, right. It you know, depends on the person. So yeah. self-righteous about that in my, you know, everybody should be as hardworking and focused as I am, which is... Well, and it's an old it's an old model again. You know, you're talking about the industrial age, the industrial revolution of, you know, sort of making assumptions about people and that people are like this and their behavior is predictable. And a lot of it is, you know, I do a lot of reading on bias, unconscious bias. All there are about at least 150 types of biases that are basically macros. Our brains pretty much use 20% of the energy in our whole body, right? So it's only 2% of our body, but it uses 20%. Oh, wow. So okay. our brains are really, really good at creating shortcuts. But some of those shortcuts don't necessarily serve, and they cause you to draw wrong conclusions. So if you're not aware and you walk past someone and you don't like them and they're looking at CNN and they shouldn't be looking at CNN, you're not going to give them a break. You're going to be like, they never work. Right. But if it's someone you know... And someone you like, you'd be like, oh, they're probably just checking something. So you're going to give them some kind of, you right. know, a reason for, for And this all is. happens in, like, milliseconds. Uh, it, it took me ten times longer to talk about it. Right. And so, like, this person that was struggling in her office, she had all these stories going on about people. Yeah. And once she was able to kind of come back to what she wanted for herself, what she was looking for, and just coming back to her purpose. Because that's the other thing. Purpose isn't necessarily a lofty, big thing. Purpose could just be to enjoy what I do. Right. Purpose can be, and that's so powerful, because when you're working from a sense of what matters to you and what's important to you, it changes everything. It does. Then you don't care about right. all the little stuff. And, the, and right. then you're creative about it. You come up with little games. You come up with, you know, I watched this with my sister-in-law. I My mother-in-law passed away about a month ago, and um, we brought her home. Um, and my sister-in-law is a doctor, and I got to see in action why she's so good at what she does. Because the things that we needed to do at home weren't things that were necessarily easy. And so what would happen with the rest of us who are not medical professionals, even some of the easier stuff, we would panic and freak out. We'd go into fight or flight and not be able to do anything. She saw everything as an opportunity to come up with a different solution. That's mastery. Right. It's the person who, and in a workplace too, when someone likes what they do and, they're, and they, they enjoy the work, instead of saying, oh no, it's ruined... Now we can't do anything or go into some fear mode like, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. What instead they do is they're like, let's try this. Right. Let's try. And I watched her do these things where I was stopped dead in my tracks. And I was like, I don't know about that. And she would just find these new ways wow. to get something. Let's try this. That's so great. And so and, and mastery that, improv. Right. You know, and I, I mean, I love doing that when I'm coaching people with their stories. I'll be like, that's OK. No, keep going. Keep going. Right. Sometimes we're so busy editing or judging or whatever. And I'm like, it's OK. It's coming out how it's supposed to come out. I think that's what happened to me earlier when we started talking. I started being like, oh, I'm on a podcast. I better say some really important things. And then I'm not listening to what's going on. And I'm like, what are we talking about? Listening? <laughs> No, isn't it? So it's so right. true. Yeah. So just just to come back to this whole owning your part. So yeah. you were working with this woman who was really like she wanted to literally walk out in the middle of the workday and create right. a scene and like have it be dramatic and ugly. Right. And you were able to help her reframe things, check out her stories. And then what was the end result with her? She... She ended up finding another position somewhere else, making 25% more in salary. They had a huge party for her when she left, and she got to see the good side of the people that she really enjoyed working with. And she left on a high, and she didn't burn any bridges. She didn't call anybody out because she realized that some of the things that were frustrating her were not things that could be attributable attributable, say that five times fast, um, you, know, <laughs> attributable. To, you know, because if you have, if you're in a tough management situation, there's so many factors there and you have to make a decision when you're there. I either accept what's going on here 
and find a way around it and make a game out of it or whatever it is we decide to do because I want to stay or say, no, it's t- it's time to go. Leave. It's right. time to pay attention to what I want. And once she got back to the thing that mattered most to her, she was able to sell that easily in other job interviews. And so and has been has been, ha- you know, happy in the work they're doing ever since. And that to me, I love it. So, yay! Yeah. But to yeah. me, that's the gift of coaching. And a good coach is to have have the people you're working with feel empowered so that they're creating, actually co-creating what they want instead of react, react, react. Right. And we're kind of that, you know, here we go up and down once again for the listeners. I'm drawing an up and down, up and down. But a coach is kind of that through line of I'm paying attention to what it is you want. I'm paying attention to the thing that you need. I'm there for you to touch base with me. And the energy that I'm providing to you is a stabilizing force while you have all other kinds of inputs going on. Right. Right. And I'm letting you tell your story because it's important for me to understand your story and for you to hear your story. And then the more you hear, the clearer you get. Right. You know, and then you come back to and then it's not such a big deal. You know, it still can be hard because we hang on to those people that we don't like. It's all his fault if it weren't for him. And that is one of the stories. Right. So where I work, there was one person with the seat at the table that was never going to leave. And. That was never going to change. So I had to make that part of the story and ask myself, with this included in the story as a non-negotiable, is this where you want to continue to be? And the answer was no. No. You know, but it does take a little bit to get there. But yeah, I mean, coaching definitely helps. So so let me hear a little bit more from you. I want to hear some of them because... You've been on a you've been on a wild ride. You've had an incredible life. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, Up, lots of ups and downs. I guess you know. I guess what comes to mind for me is I you know I was at this one very corporate restaurant in Midtown, and I you know when I first started there, I had just gotten sober and moved to New York City. <laughs> And, I'm sorry, I'm laughing no. with you. You're laughing, right? And did the New York oh City my God. And, and did the New York City Marathon. Like it was what? it was I was like, hi, I'm hired. Like I was getting trained during 9-11. Like it was crazy. <gasps> and um and it was and I really helped grow this place. I was very proud of the work I did. I was in charge of their I helped them build their training. They didn't have any training stuff when I started, like, and um went through a lot of different things, you know. And, um, and my plan was, you know, I was like, okay, let me just pay off this credit card or let me just get this done. And then I'll officially leave. And so I had bought three houses at the top of the market in 2008, the worst timing ever. And so when the market crashed, I did not know what to do. And I Mm. was not willing to declare bankruptcy like everybody else. And, uh, so I thought, I'll just figure it out. I'll just figure it out. So I kept staying and working while I was pursuing my speaking and my comedy and doing, you know, I was working 70 hour weeks all the time until my body finally Mm. was like, Elaine, you're, we're tapping out, we're tapping out. Um, And so I'm grateful that I was finally able to listen because my body had been speaking to me for like a couple of years. I'd been in excruciating hip pain and Mm. different things. And, um, but what I did when I finally quit uh, I wrote a long letter to this restaurant and it was like a divorce letter. It was like a dear John, we are, we're breaking up. This is really for real. And it was, it was such a powerful thing because, you know, I couldn't call all my old people I've trained. I, you know, I trained all of the managers. Like I, you know, anyway, I, there was just too much. There was so much stuff, but it was so empowering to write the letter mm-hmm. and to acknowledge what a great part of my life it had been, but also what an incredibly toxic place it had been and had become. And, you know, but like, ultimately I was the one who kept staying, you right. know, and I was justified and like, but I have all this real estate stuff. I have all this Michigas. I have, you know, right. So it was really you know, humble pie time for Elaine here. Like I did feel like I was coughing up hairballs to go, wow, I, even though it was really toxic the last few years, I kept, I kept staying. Right. 
you know. But you're not mad at yourself for that. You well, know, you're what you're talking about is also saying, yeah, I did. I did that over and over again. And then when the awareness came, you know, because that's the other thing. As humans, we we we're it's all experimenting. Right. We have to keep trying things. Right. Because there is no one size fits all solution. It just doesn't work that way. Even and though so, I think our brains want that. You know, you're oh. talking about like there's a part of me, I want that certainty. I want to know if I do A plus B, I'm gonna get C. Right. You promised. And that's kind of fundamentalism in right. a nutshell, right? right. Is this, if you do this and then you do that, then that's the formula for this. And um and in general, life for the most part doesn't work that way. Right. And it's so brilliant of you to write that letter because again, it was the awareness of here's the whole picture. Here's what's going on all around me. It's also a way of letting go of something so that you don't have the coulda, woulda, shouldas, right? right? Because when something like that happens, it's very easy to go back and say, oh, I was there for this long. I should have left when I was, and right. the thing is, don't go there, people. Were we, Do were not we gonna go come up down with that a, road. Like, a, like, coulda, woulda, shoulda, beep, 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 <laughs> coulda, woulda, shoulda. Yeah, right. I mean, there's always yeah that. No, and it was, I mean, I, I had to go through periods of, um, you know, forgiving myself. Because yeah. I did not know what else to do other than keep working right. as, as hard and fast as I could to try to, you know, I had bought all three ha of the houses at higher, you know, value and all that stuff. So, it was, you know, it was a long, sort of a long pruning, if you will. Right. And, um, but... But as hard as it was to, you know, see see my part in it, it's yeah. always humbling. Oh, yeah. I've done so much work. I know. I, I, I should just... be so, so, I should be levitated by now. I know. But, <laughs> but it's, there's so much freedom. You know, we were talking about that in the other uh, previous episode of just being vulnerable and saying, yeah, you know what? I'm, I totally messed up. Right. And that's, and that's something I'm working on more to, to be able to say that quicker right you know i held on to my, oh my god i held on to my houses let me let me just let me just try i mean i had this right. that's a whole nother episode but like i just held on and finally when the universe was beating me to a you know like i was battered and bruised by this house and all the things i had been through heroin kids and fire and arson and Oh properties property managers who were horrendous and you know like i finally i was like okay 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 uncle you know <laughs> and i i sold it for a huge loss yeah but i did the best i could right i was doing the best i could so i think you know as we're talking about awareness you know i'm a huge fan of yoga it's changed my life it has helped me calm the fuck down <laughs> I wasn't going to say it. And I thought, why not? You can always, we can always bleep it. Um, it's, I feel, I feel like it's a form of physical prayer. Mm. It gets me out of my head and into my heart and my soul. I'm just a better human being when I, when I practice it. And there are some days my balance is like on and other days I'm like, Oh my God, am I 89 today? <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, I, I just, and I love what it teaches. And mm. so every time I do a back bend, I don't know why back bends, maybe because you're just opening your chest up. I, I say, I, f I forgive you, Elaine. Wow. And then if I'm doing several, I'll think of who else I need to forgive because mm. what I've learned from Landmark and all these things for me, forgiveness is, it's not a one and done. Yeah. Damn it. It's a process. It's a process. And I have to forgive myself um, often because I, you know, I am very much a take action. Let's do it. All right. Come on. I don't sit around and contemplate too much. Mm -hmm. And I'm practicing doing that more. But, um, you know, I've made so many mistakes in my life. And I, and I think that's, I guess, part of my journey of of awareness of okay lane maybe you don't need to worry most people need to get off the couch maybe you should learn how to sit on a couch yeah exactly and you brought up something so important which is the idea of while you're in a practice of some kind and in this case yoga you say that phrase to yourself and then you use that time so you're you're actually already doing something and you're using that time to um to, it's kind of like adding that that's how that's how you start to forgive that's how you start to make changes is by adding these little 
little sayings or um, mantras, right? You know, bit by bit. Um, I do that with my Alexander technique. You know, when I'm standing at the train station, you know, while I'm waiting for a train, I just remember my directions and I just r- feel my feet into the ground. Mm. And I see a picture of this anatomy picture that uh, my Alexander teacher had shown me. And I just see that. And, it, and my body just immediately starts to organize itself. But that's what it looks like. You're doing, you're doing these little tweaks along the way. You know, you're, you're in the office, for example, as I was trying to say goodbye and not, you know, be, be a jerk about it was just to use certain things. And we might've talked about this in the first episode. Like when a phone rang, I'd use that as an opportunity to sit a little taller and take in a breath. So you use yoga, it's powerful in and of itself, but you add a little something on there. When I do child pose, I do this. When I do a back bend, I do this. That doesn't mean you have to litter it with all kinds of stuff and so to the point where you're like nuts trying to remember it all. But it's just, again, it's a sacred time and it allows you to be able to t- pause even in a movement mm. and just express forgiveness, express gratitude, you know, and then awareness is sometimes just stopping and being mm. for a minute. It's not going to hurt to take a full breath. In fact, it's restorative. You're actually, when you take that full breath, you're telling your body that everything's okay. Because when you're not fully breathing, your body is like, what's going on up there? Right. I don't know. Fight, what's fight, going freeze. on? Freeze. What's happening? Yeah, what's going what's on? happening? Right. Right. And so, and so these are all things that you have available. You don't need to have any special expertise to do this. You know, it's just a full belly breath. You know? I love that. Yeah. So, Kathy, what would you tell somebody if they're listening and if they were just like, I kind of feel stuck. I, I feel like I'm aware. Ah! What would you, what would be some of your brilliant coaching? No pressure. Yeah, no pressure. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jump. Sit. Stay. Um, Heal. <laughs> er, er, er. Um, well, the first thing is, is that, you know, I know, I don't know. I, I'm kind of a do-it-yourselfer. And so the first thing I want to do is like, just go read a whole bunch of books and then fix myself and then come up to everybody later. Again, this is part of my trying to pretend I'm not vulnerable. Right. Your um, Irish hashtag Kathy so white. Yeah, yeah, it's just part of that whole that whole that whole background. But really, you know, reach out to a coach. You know, give give someone a call. Give me a call. Talk to somebody. You know, and and just say, here's what's going on with me. Just sharing a little bit of moment. And and again, picking the right person. Read the room. Pick the right person who's a person who's able to listen. Right. Somebody who's earned the right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Brene Brown talks about that. Like, mm-hmm. so many times, I know, uh, looking back, you know, sometimes you just... Do you ever see, like, videos of your past and you're <laughs> cringing? Uh, I, I remember talking about when I had just bought my three-family house in Bloomfield. And I remember talking about... Oh my God, I don't know how I'm, you know, if I can get a tenant or not. And I stupidly admitted that to my maitre d and this other really New York wise ass bartender. And they both started talking about how they had always had their rental properties filled from like they just, and I remember thinking, you just like set that up for them to like lop one right into you, Elaine, you know? So yeah. yeah, so I I would I would agree with that. Like if you if you're somebody who's like I I'm doing all these things but I still feel stuck. Um there's something too great about like putting pen to paper too. I it's I so have powerful that letter it? you wrote. I have a tool that um I called it the what was I thinking letter. Oh. And so I wrote that towards the end of my career where I just it was very similar. So I just wrote what's not to like? You have an office. You're on 5th Avenue in New York City. You know, you're earning a decent salary. You're, I mean, what what is not to like? You've got all these things. Accoutrement. Accoutrement. Right. And, um, but then I said, this is the way things are managed here. Right. And I don't have a say in that. And my main goal is I want work to be a more enjoyable experience for people. When people are motiv- motivated, they don't need me to motivate them. They don't need you to motivate them. They are motivated inside by the things that sp- spark joy. They spark joy for you. Um, but that's, it's what are those things that, 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 that you love doing? Just having somebody say you did a great job on that. You don't need a group hug. I don't need an award. 
but just an acknowledgement of what I'm doing. And there's still such a sense of, you know, I can't let them know how good they are. They're, they're going to get too big of a head. Now, that is that could happen. But a good leader knows how to manage that. Right. That's the whole point. You have a lot of organizations that don't have good leaders. They have people who got appointed to a role where they're managing people. They don't even know what they're doing. I think that's like 98% of it's corporate huge, America. It's a huge, right? part of it. Right. You know, and, um, and when I was in leadership roles, I took it really, really seriously because, you know, I would rather see somebody be happy in what they're doing because they're going to work better. They're going to work smarter. They're not going to get sick. You know, right. I got cancer. Red, flag, huge, flag. No. Oh, do not you know, pass, leave. Go. go. Right. What you're doing, what you're doing isn't working. You're internalizing all this stuff, you know, and um, and that's a whole nother story for another day. But again, I wrote the letter and it just gave me clarity. And I also wrote it because I know human nature and I know me. I was going to leave there when I left. And then six months down the road, I was going to be like, oh, is that the right thing? I don't know. Oh, shoot. I picked up that letter when it actually happened. It didn't happen until like maybe a year after. And I read the letter and I was like, I know why I did what mm, I did. And good. what I did in that moment was based on all the information that was available to me at the time. Yeah. And that I made a wise decision at the time because that's the hindsight isn't 2020 business where we go back and we start reading stuff in. Well, I could have done this and I could have done that. And it's like, no, you couldn't. Because you didn't know. Because you didn't write. Because you right. have this limited, you know, it makes me think of breakups. Like, yeah. I, I, I've been through so many. <laughs> oh, and I, you know, I, it seems like one day I would only remember the good things. Right. And then I would just be so sad and depressed and mad. And then the next day I would only remember the bad things. Right. And I, and I knew, oh, this is what you do, Elaine. But then I would forget. And I would torture myself about why did I stay? And then it was... Right. You know, so I guess my point is that, yeah, our memories are very subjective and... And yeah, so if you're making a big decision now, it doesn't even have to be around work. If you're planning a trip somewhere or making a decision not to go somewhere and it's a big decision, write down what you were thinking at the time. Because chances are you are, what you were doing in this moment with the information you have available is 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 the very best that you can do in this moment. That's so great. And it's so easy with the passage of time to judge something. But but you're but it's an unfair judgment, and it's a waste of time. It's such it's a, a waste, waste of time, time and energy, isn't it? Yes. yes. So oh my god, you're so brilliant. So if people want to know more. Do you do um, workshops? Do you one on one? I love working one on one. Um, I think that's where a lot of the real magic happens, if you if you want to call it that. But. It's the energy of working with one person and being able to focus on that one person. Because yes, can you do a workshop and and have and people have a great time? Yes, you can certainly do that. What I find though is that I do best when something's really tailored to me, mm. when someone really gets what's going on with me. And I use humor, but I don't use the kind of humor where you're making fun of somebody, but it's just the the idea of when you get somebody. When you when you get somebody or they get you, how that feels to that you really gotten. feel like you have an ally. Yeah. You know, and so and for you, too, because you do a lot of great camera work. And I know oh, we talked about you. it before, but. Um, well, I love the one on one, too. I, I think that working with another client to me is sick. It's so sacred. They're sharing their most intimate, you know, and yeah. and I always laugh because people come to me for one thing and then I usually end up coaching <laughs> them on, you know. So, I mean, yeah. I, right now I'm focusing on, you know, helping people tell the story of their business or their brand and get comfortable and confident on camera and publicly speaking, too, if they still want to do that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, and I do I do workshops. I, I'm, I have a Find Your Funny, Ooh. which is fun for people who, you know, you've already spoken some and you know that you want to work on that humor muscle. Um, that's a lot of fun, but I keep everything really small because, um, I think, yeah, if things get too big, I, I always say there's no hiding in my group program. Right. Everyone gets to do it, but it's a very safe and sacred. Oh, it totally space. is. I mean, that's the thing. Cause I've worked with you 
And I very rare, I never had one of those times, like, you know, the joke, the running joke at New Year's where people hire a trainer and they're like, I love my trainer. My trainer's so fabulous. And like a weekend, they're trying to hire someone to do a hit on them. Right. right. <laughs> you know, but when I worked with you, it was always just like, so it was so much fun oh, because good. I very much felt, felt seen. And so, um, yeah, I hope I hope that people got a little something out of this. And the awareness topic, we could go on for for decades, so we probably will, but not in this cut, right. not in this broadcast. Well, yeah, and thanks for listening. And make sure that you um, leave comments or, or reach out if you have questions we, you want us to answer, yeah. because God knows we've done the training. <laughs> We've been training for 30 let years. Us, but yeah, you know, I always think, let us have done the work for you. I mean, we can't do all the work for you, and no one could do all the work for me. But still, there are some things that that you can get some, you know, some, some little ahas with. Yeah, you know? and I mean, I always think I have always hired people because I want to learn what they have. I want what they have, and I don't want to spend the 10, 20 years. Like, right. I want them to shorten my learning Right. Curve. So that's one reason I've been such a huge fan. So yeah. anyway, thanks so much, Kathy. Oh, this is a blast. So much fun. I Thank loved it. You. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. Next time.